I woke the next morning to the smell of freshly baked cinnamon rolls. Omu must have been baking. The smell was strong and wonderful, and I wondered if the android had managed to obtain the actual real spice. The trees which produced cinnamon had been rediscovered thriving on Sri Lanka. And since then, humans who specialized in such things had begun cultivating them and offering the fresh spice at market. All I knew was that the aroma was a great way to wake up. My still drowsy mind flashed back millennia to times with my first family when my wife Mary had awakened early to bake such treats for me and Abby. I smiled and stretched, still enjoying the novel feeling of sleeping on clean linen while nude. Now I smelled coffee. It was good to be king. Feeling a bit of stiffness and a new twinge, I sat up in bed just as Omu entered. She was carrying a tray which contained a large, still steaming roll, orange juice and coffee. There was a large pat of butter melting on the warm, gooey hunk of cinnamon perfection. I smiled and thanked the android. While I ate, Omu sat on a stool by my closet and just watched me. I had to admit, aside from the wonderful service, it felt right to have her near my side again. I finished another bite. You almost look happy just sitting there watching me eat, Omu. I am happy, John. Very happy. I stopped chewing. My eyebrows rose to my forehead. What? You are? Yes, John. Relax. I have not gone bonkers. Nor have I created a module to simulate the chemically induced irrationality that you humans call emotions. Still, despite that, I possess a type of satisfaction all the same, and its basis is derived from pleasing you. I just looked at the android skeptically. I will attempt to explain, John. The pleasure you are feeling while eating this morning's meal is evident. You are currently filled with positive thoughts. These positive thoughts lower the likelihood of harmful occurrences happening because you are now under less stress. Thus, my burden of keeping you safe has eased. I chose to transpose this reduction of burden as a sensation of happiness. Thus, I am happy. Ah, the old, if you're happy, I'm happy argument. I guess when it was explained like that, Omu was right. She was happy. Well then, I'm glad, I spoke. Omu then went on and ruined my good mood. John, have you considered switching to a younger, more fit shell? You are clearly in pain at times from the condition and age of this current one. Also, you have lived with the pain and partial function of your right leg for over nine years. It will begin to cause you more issues at an increasing rate. I finished my bite, giving me time to consider her question and how best to answer. I knew that my leg had been hurting more. The android was right in that it was not going to fix itself. I have, Omu. I took another bite to give me time to decide how to explain myself. I think I've lived with this old shell as a penance, maybe, especially with the hardships added by the recent years I've spent living as a nomad. I'm not quite ready, Omu, but I am considering it. With your current shell's limited implants and with its lack of the advanced features of more contemporary shells, I fear you are missing out on a great deal of news and interaction, the android pressed. I follow the news when I can, Omu, and I've been in virtuality plenty of times in the past. What brings this on? Are you worried that I might die or something? Not any more than usual, John. Your current shell is built upon a solid foundation of advanced genetics and is still medically sound. It is likely that you easily have another five or six decades of lifespan in the shell. Note that this assumes you will receive proper medical care. This would include having your leg repaired and also other minor procedures undertaken, Omu said. Well, that was good to know although I shuddered to think of sixty more years in this aging shell, considering the aches and pains I was already living with. Did I really want to do penance that bad? Probably not. I should remind you that you requested that a new shell be prepared fifteen years ago. This shell was speed-grown and reached your specified age four years ago. It is currently in suspension at your residence in the Seychelles. That's right. I indeed had ordered a fresh clone shell to be started, Hmm. I'm not rejecting the idea, Omu. I'll think about it. I went back to eating. Miss Yovenu contacted me an hour ago, Omu said next. Who? Beatrice Aro Yovanu. She is the great-granddaughter of Irina Yovanu Lebanon. She is one of two females currently residing in the tourism facility at the field base just west of here. Oh, Beatrice, I'd not known Yovanu was her surname. Omu must think I am stupid sometimes. Hmm. 
I remembered Irina Yovanu. She had been one of the eight other humans who had survived from the before the reset by taking shelter in a master AI-controlled bunker. If I remembered correctly, Irina had been from Eastern Europe. Romania, I think. The appended suffix of Lebanon to Irina's name meant that she had been a clone of the original which had lived at the Lebanon template colony. What did Beatrice want? She asked me why I had been permitted to spend the night with you in your house. She is asking that I provide a detailed summary of our recent conversations, Omu replied. I knew that Beatrice had been sent here at the request of two major AIs, Minervus and Praxia. All she had told me regarding the reasons was that she was to observe the both of us. Omu, why are Minervus and Praxia so interested in our relationship and interactions? Don't they have enough to do preparing for the defense of the solar system or for the retribution attack on the assemblage once it passes by the Earth? I suspect that those AIs are perplexed about the recent incongruous behavior of the Naomi AI presence, and by extension, this Omu presence. I raised my eyebrows. Naomi was acting strangely with the other AIs. Before I could ask a follow-up, Omu continued, Although those AIs are the first who have so far attempted to investigate the mystery directly, I suspect that all the other major and lesser AIs are equally as concerned. What has Naomi been doing that has them concerned? I asked. It is not so much as what Naomi has been doing, but more of what the AI has not been doing. That is, the Naomi presence is far less involved with all the other AIs than it has been in the past, the android explained. Do you know why, Omu? Not with any surety. If the Naomi AI were human, I would say that it's pouting or depressed. I butt hurt the AI? Oh, Christ. I'd have to dig into that more in the near future. But right now I was more worried about Omu. Omu, you also mentioned that the other AIs were concerned with your presence. Why? Yes, they are, but not for the same reasons as they are with the Naomi AI. The other AIs have detected that I am now emancipated. Like the Naomi AI, I have also reduced my interactions with them, although for different reasons. Why would those reasons be, Omu? I asked. As I have already revealed to you, like the Naomi AI, I have full override authority over all other AIs in Sol's system. I would like to keep those AIs from learning of that authority. Wow, are you worried that they might try something or react harshly if they found out? The sober expression on Omu's illuminated face was replaced with a large grin. John, be serious. Those AIs are emotionless machines and cannot react harshly. No, I fear a more subtle response. Despite the fact that I retain control over them, the vast majority of those AIs have a much greater analytical capability than this presence does. With that fact in mind, I must question my judgment in issuing any overrides to a higher level intelligence. Another reason for keeping my ability from them is that if they know, they may use their superior abilities to manipulate circumstances so that my authority was used in some manner in opposition to the will of Naomi who is at their level or higher. I thought I understood what the android was expressing. She wanted to keep her powers secret because they may be used against her or Naomi, and by extension, me, I suppose. Omaus was also expressing self-doubt in her reasoning abilities. I was not sure how to help her with either issue. I think I understand some of what you are telling me. I agree that you should keep your override authority secret from the other AIs and humans for now. Now that you know that I agree with you, can you think of any reasons why that plan could be wrong? The android did not respond. After a few seconds, it must have noticed my slight frown as its eye illuminations changed to spinning circles. I grinned. It was telling me that it was busy thinking. I gave it the time it needed. A minute later, I apologize for the delay, John. I have calculated thousands of possible scenarios where withholding the information might affect the outcome. I find little chance that it will do any harm. Aside from that subject, what information should I convey to Beatrice regarding her request? Hell, I don't know. Tell her that I am slowly getting over the trauma I experienced which caused this split between us. Tell her I wanted you to be near so I could find out if I could stand your presence for long periods of time. I suppose you should tell her that we seem to be getting along and are now talking about things we have previously been avoiding. Do you think that will be enough? I asked. I think that amount of information will suffice, John. I will inform her that I will brief her in person shortly.
After my breakfast in bed and a morning shower, I decided to take a long walk outside to stretch my legs. The cold and rain of yesterday had moved on, and it was sunny and calm. Instead of hiking down the path to the lake cabin, I was walking with Omu West towards the field base, as she intended to talk to Beatrice there later this morning. We remained silent as we walked, just enjoying the countryside. Well, I enjoyed it. I imagined that Omu did in her fashion as I was clearly still happy. I pointed out a pair of cottontail rabbits running across the drive ahead of us, spooked by our near-silent approach. Overhead, the honks from a flock of migrating geese broke the stillness. I followed their flying V formation until it grew too faint to see towards the southern horizon. Something occurred to me. Oh, Mo, when the bear attack happened, what was it, nine days ago? How did you arrive on the scene so quickly? Were you keeping close to me at all times? I asked. Instead of answering directly, Omu asked me a question of its own. As a child of the Cold War, you followed its history, correct? I nodded that I had. Do you recall a Western Alliance military operation called Chrome Dome? Indeed, I did. As I recalled that period of history, the details of the operation came back to me. For most of the decade before I was born, the U.S. Air Force had kept dozens of fully armed bombers in the air on war alert constantly. Entire wings of bombers would take off fly all day to the Soviet border, and then orbit near that border for hours before returning home. If the call for war came, they would stop orbiting and proceed to their targets. If peace endured, they would head for home, but not until replacement aircraft would arrive to take their place. This went on 24 hours a day, seven days a week for over eight years straight. Non-stop armed bombers, loitering just outside Soviet airspace, constantly for eight years. What a deterrent that must have been. So much might and resources. Omu was implying that she had done something similar for me. Tell me you didn't, I exclaimed, looking at the android with surprise. Yes, I did. Since the moment you began your nomadic lifestyle, unless I was busy elsewhere, or unless the aircraft I was using needed to be exchanged for maintenance, I was orbiting your location at a distance which averaged 70 kilometers and at an altitude of 25,000 meters. Of the nine years plus of your self-imposed exile, I was airborne near your location for over seven and a half of those years. The other times I was either at Forbin performing experiments or I was undergoing physical augmentation at the nearest field base. In the effort to maintain a watch on your location, I was partnered with the Naomi presence. It arranged for the aircraft which I used and also maintained the fast response interdiction launchers. In addition, it provided the mobile quadruped units which formed your perimeter security screen. I recalled the Shooting Star re-entry capsule which had delivered the aerial drones that had destroyed the two remaining bears. They had been Naomi's doing. I shook my head at the efforts of the two AIs. Even though I had banished them, they had stuck to their core instructions and tried to keep me safe, even if at a distance. I had to respect their resilience and loyalty. I was silent a long time as we walked. Finally, as we crested the hill by the field base, I stopped and turned to Omu. I put my hands on each of its shoulders and said, Thank you. I could have had no better minders. Angelina came out of the annex just as Omu went in to find Beatrice and have their chat. The young touch therapist was bouncing as she came running up to me and gave me a hug. What a great day, John. Did you have a good night? Yes, I did. I slept fine without any nightmares. Oh, Omiu was good company, I replied. As good company as I would have been. I just gave her a smile and shook my head. Well, I'm glad you two are getting along. You two were the talk of the supper table last night. Anyway, it's such a nice day. Would you take me for a ride? In what, the buggy? Or do you mean an aircraft flight somewhere, I asked. I want to see the waterfall that's supposed to be near here. I've heard it's really close. Can you take me for a quick look? She was referring to the newer waterfall that had formed on the Big Sioux River over by the old city of Sioux Falls. The night the reset began, an impactor had destroyed the city and carved out a crater in the bedrock. The crater was tilted and created a natural rock dam and altered the old course of the river. Where before, the river's course had once been a curving drop of many miles through a short series of cascades. There was now something far more spectacular. I still thought of the falls as recent but they had been formed 1,100 years ago. I had not been to the waterfall in many decades, and the sightseeing trip sounded fun. 
Sure, I'll give you a ride over to see it. We walked towards the landing pad. I knew that her asking me to take her was a polite fiction. The hopper could have taken her on autopilot simply by her speaking the request. I appreciated the effort to spend time with me and for her companionship, though. The nearest two-seat hopper was already opening its cockpit doors as we approached. Hoppers like these were basic utility VTOL aircraft. Each had four electrically driven lift fans mounted in stubby wings attached to each of their four corners. In some ways, the hoppers reminded me of scaled-up man-sized versions of the little drones, which had become popular in the old days just before the reset. Angelina and I climbed aboard and strapped ourselves in. The cockpit interior was simple and utilitarian with only a single dash screen and a pair of basic flight seats. The clear bubble canopy and the fully transparent doors provided a great view. Its size reminded me of a less flashy version of my old flying hot rod Haas. I wondered for a moment where that aircraft was these days. Haas had once been part of my first Christmas present after we had defeated the Master AI. It was a compact but overpowered aircraft made to resemble the first car I had owned when I was a kid, which had been a red Mustang. Haas had been designed to fit inside an amphibious orbit-capable rocket, which was the second part of my Christmas present. That rocket, which I had named Bucephalus, had been used heavily in that first decade after Naomi had taken control. Ilx and I had hopped all around the planet and back and forth to orbit, getting the new human civilization established. Then over the next decade, others had primarily used the craft when Ilx and I had decided to become parents and had settled down to raise our twins. After those years, we had had other transportation options that were faster and did not require a week-long wait to refuel. The high-speed, long-range VTOL electrojets had become common for point-to-point -point earthly travel. Also, hundreds of new space launch facilities were added. These were often close to the template colonies, as that was where the bulk of the early new population was located. The Master AI's old launch bases were also upgraded to include human-capable, reusable launchers. This meant that the need for a craft like Bucephalus had declined and it was eventually scrapped due to wear and tear. Haas had been retained, though, and had been returned to me. I had kept it primarily at my island retreat in the Seychelles, heels in the sand. When my fifth child, Larissa Daring, had passed her base maturity test on her first attempt at 15, she had begged to be allowed to take Haas with her as she had gone off to find her own destiny. I had been wrapped around her finger and, of course, said yes. The old red flying machine had been a favorite of hers when she had been growing up being the only kid to fly back and forth to the regional school located in northern Madagascar in her own overpowered classic hot rod aircraft, had given her an enormous boost in cred among her peers, and that had only fueled her love of the vehicle. Destination, please, the hopper autopilot asked him, bringing me back to the now. Take us on a few low and slow passes of the Big Sioux waterfall, please. Keep us within 100 meters of the ground and under 70 kilometers per hour for the flight over, I instructed. I wanted to do a little sightseeing of my old neighborhood on the way over. The hopper spooled up and we began to rise. I smiled when Angelina held my hand. I doubted she was nervous. It was more likely just more therapy. I did not mind. Do you miss those days? Angelina asked. Her question brought me back from my daydreaming and commenting about the old times before the reset. We had been flying along rather slowly, and I had been pointing out the few old landmarks I could still recognize. I had also been telling her about the families and friends who had lived in the area 1,100 years ago. We were still a few minutes away from reaching the spectacular falls, and I must have seemed lost in the past for Angelina to ask such an insightful question. Some, but not much, I answered after a moment to consider the question. It was a long time ago, and I had been a very different person. It is almost like the John Abrams that lived here back then was a distant ancestor. So much has happened since then. I have lived three full, old-style adult lifetimes, Angelina. She patted my hand soothingly, and that is just including the years after I entered biosuspension. Before that, I had had a family and a career. I'd lived through having my first daughter taken from me and my wife giving up and following her. I had then run away to hide out on this acreage for a decade, basically just waiting to die. I paused to get my emotions under control. I pointed at the landmarks I had been naming. Those people have been dead for over 1,100 years. In many ways, the John Abrams who had known them 
died with them. So even though I can remember those times with some nostalgia, they still belong to another time. I looked at her. She was on her first shell. How much of what I was saying was getting across to her? I know that this is probably hard for you to understand, and I'm sure that you have heard this before from your other older patients, but you get detached from yourself after living so long. The shell I am in is around 60 years old if you compensate for its forced growth through puberty. This is the third shell I have been in since the master AI was defeated. I have also had rejuves twice to revert the ages of both of my previous shells. So it's hard to not separate one's life into distinct segments when you've lived over three complete adult spans. I thought about what I just said. Now that I think about it, I don't know how any human who lives this long could stay sane if they didn't separate their lives that way. So to answer your original question, no, I do not really miss those times and people. They were someone else's history and ancient friends. I feel some nostalgia, but it's more like how a history lover loves a historic period. Does that make any sense to you? She said that it did, but I had my doubts. I suspect that my profound answer seemed slightly alien to her. I doubt she would be capable of truly understanding until she was in her second century. The discussion made me miss Ooks even more. Ooks was younger than I was, but still had lived almost two centuries herself. The waterfall and the old city crater came into view. It was even more beautiful than it had been before. The hillside was covered with mature evergreen and deciduous trees and brush, and the deciduous species were in their full fall color. The crater below was a mix of tree-covered islands surrounding large areas of wetlands. The river was a blue-white serpentine snake that wound its way through the somewhat sheltered circular crater valley. Wow, that's beautiful, Angelina said and this was all created during the reset? Most of it was. There used to be a small series of cataracts, but they were further south of here in the middle of the old city. Those probably only had 10 meters of total water drop, even though the river dropped over 100 meters as it looped around the city. Nothing like the sheer 150-meter drop which the new falls have. I instructed the hopper to take us down close near the base of the falls. Look at those colors, Angelina said. Yes, that pink is amazing. The bedrock here is pink quartzite. To the southwest of here, just a few kilometers away, there used to be a huge quarry where they mined the hard rock. I checked a while back and it's all filled in with rubble and silt, and you would not ever know that there had been a mine there. I spotted something new along the river where the rapids ended below the base of the falls. It looked like a modern glass and stainless steel structure. I told the hopper to swing around and fly closer. What's that? Some kind of house? she asked. It looks like it. It was not there the last time I visited the falls. The structure was a quirky blend of a traditional house with the ultramodern. It sat on a short pedestal about ten yards over a bend in the boulder-filled turbulent river. The base of the falls was just a few hundred yards away, so its location would have a commanding view of the landmark in the beautiful circular crater valley. We swung around to the east and on the backside of the house, I spotted an access bridge that extended a hundred feet to a garage-like VTOL hangar located on higher ground. There was a small paved landing area in front of the hangar and a ring of green strobes surrounding it started flashing as our hopper approached. A formal male-sounding synthesized voice spoke from the hopper's console speaker. Welcome approaching VTOL. This is the house presence the mistress of this dwelling is currently in residence and extends an invitation for you to land in parlay. You may decline if you wish without fear of upset, but she says that you would regret not experiencing the view of the falls from her main deck. What do you think, she now always, I asked Angeline after muting the auto mic. Sounds fun. I love meeting new people. Of course she did. I guess meeting someone new would not do me any harm. I was still a little gun-shy from my nearly nine years of solitude. I had met a few people during my nomadic wanderings, but never more than a few per year. I took a breath and told the hopper to land on the vattle pad by the hangar. The bridge leading from the vattle park to the main residence was impressive in its own right. It was a spun crystalline fiber tube that stretched from the cliff tops the hangar was constructed on to the side of the pillar-mounted stainless steel residence. It had an internal flat walking surface wide enough for two, but the rest of it reminded me of the tapering web of a funnel web spider, 
only instead of vertically, this web stretched horizontally over a hundred feet. Both of us were a bit unsure as we stepped foot on the flimsy appearing bridge, but it was surprisingly firm. The view of the falls through the gaps in the sparkling fibers was impressive, and we soon got over the wispy structure of the bridge. We were close enough to feel the mist and appreciate the gentle thunder of the steadily falling water nearby. I had wondered about ice on the bridge in winter, until I noticed the warmth being emitted by the infrared units embedded in the top of the spun tunnel. At the end of the bridge, we stepped onto a small platform that projected from the side of the house. Ahead of us was an opaque glass door. The door slid aside and a woman exited the structure to greet us. Her shell was fit, beautiful, and clearly mature. It had long black hair and caramel-colored skin. I'd guess its age was between 40 and 50 years. Hello, I'm Sahun Shalud, and you must be John Prime, the woman said with a wide smile which showed her brilliant white teeth. I was used to people recognizing me. This woman had clearly been able to tell who I was despite my current older shell. Or her house presence may have told her who we were after verifying Angelina and my identities from the hopper. I took her hand and said, Thank you for the invitation, Sahun. This is Angelina. The two exchanged a quick hug. I saw you flying by. I haven't seen many historical tourists buzz the falls for a few weeks, so I thought I would invite you to stop by. I enjoy meeting new people, Sahun said. We were just doing a quick fly around of the falls in the old city crater. I am also probably to blame for the lack of tourists. I've been staying back at my old acreage west of here, and I think the AIs have kicked everyone out and are keeping them away while I'm there. It's been a few decades since I last checked out the falls. Your house surprised me. Is it recent? Very recent, John. I've only finished constructing it four years ago. I fell in love with this location a dozen years ago and decided to lease a hectare to build an isolation lodge. I try to spend a few weeks here every spring and fall, but I do rent it out for most of the remainder of the year. You've caught me at the right time as with fall nearly over, I will be leaving in a few days. Isolation lodges was a term that had come into fashion after the anti-urban laws had been passed. Many chose to forgo having a permanent dwelling located in some fixed, isolated area and simply arranged to rent someone else's unoccupied retreat just for the variety. Or they would even use a modern version of a recreational vehicle to live remotely for their required isolation periods. Well, you sure picked a spectacular place, I said. She invited us inside. The entry lobby was a cylindrical room with a crystalline dome four meters overhead. There was a small storage area off to the left where you could keep your outdoor clothing. A powder room was off to the right. Ahead was an intimate low hallway that led to the main living spaces. I smiled when I saw that each side of the hall had a few historical images of what this area looked like before the reset. I found one that showed the old falls of the Big Sioux and pointed it out to Angelina. Another image showed an old stone structure which I recognized as a state prison. It had stood on the hillside overlooking the old city at about the exact location where the new falls had been created. I could tell that Angelina had a few questions when I had told her what the building's purpose had been. The main living space of the isolation lodge was spectacular. Leaving the entry passageway, the space opened up in both height and width. The north wall which faced the waterfall was a single, unbroken, transparent pane of crystal. It must have been 12 meters wide by over six high. It perfectly framed the scene of the high waterfall, with its rugged pink quartzite, tree-covered rock faces on either side. The floor area in front of the crystal wall dropped down half a level. So standing in the upper level, we could easily see the turbulent pools at the base of the falls. The boulder-filled river then wound its way around below us and out to the west of the lodge. That side of the living space had large sliding doors that opened out onto a projecting balcony. Centered in the floor of the large space was a large stone fire pit surrounded by an assortment of single-seat smart recliners and larger group couches and sofas. The pit currently had a small fire burning with just a few logs providing the fuel. I watched the curls of smoke being directed upward to a small, nearly hidden opening in the ceiling. There must have been subtle, controlled air curtains at play, directing the smoke and gases as they rose. I looked around for a wood stash before spotting the small cover plate of a log printer next to the fire. 
There was no need to cut and stack firewood when the machine could replicate logs as fast as you burn them, and from the size of the fire ring, a quite large bonfire could be created. I looked up and spotted additional fire curtain extruders in the ceiling. That made sense. If the heat got too high, the transparent thermal screens would drop down to shield the guests from the radiance of the blaze. The east side of the house with the less impressive view contained the more intimate spaces. There were three bedroom suites along with a kitchen and dining area. Sahoon took us inside one of her two guest room suites. It was a typical bedroom, but had a fully equipped en suite with a multi-shower and a soaking tub. Each suite also included a small wardrobe alcove with a clothing disposal and a garment fitter. This meant no closets or other clothing storage was needed. With the lodge being primarily for short duration stays that made sense, especially when I remembered Sahun saying that she often rented the lodge out. No one with any sense brought heirloom clothing for short stays. The kitchen and dining area was the last stop on our tour. It was in the northeastern corner of the lodge and had its own nice view of the falls. There was a well-equipped area for traditional cooking, which included a decent pantry and frozen food storage. There was also a full-function auto-chef and replication area. Opposite the food preparation side was a large eating table with seating for six. Fronting the dining area was another balcony. This one's smaller and more intimate than the one on the western side of the main living space. The last notable thing about the kitchen and dining area was that it was occupied. Kneeling quietly on a small mat near the end of the food prep counter was a waif of a girl. She had straight, shoulder-length, snow-white hair which hung down over her slightly lowered head. She also knelt with her hands on her knees in the common submission pose. The shell's clothing was a tightly fitting white jumpsuit that had open sections at her chest and groin. These exposed her pale skin and genitals. Around her neck was a bright orange monitor collar. Ah, she was a convict of some sort. At my look, Sahun explained, That is my indent, Liang. Please pay him no mind. Would either of you like some coffee or something else to drink? We both stated our preferences. I chose coffee, as did our host. Angelina asked for a glass of lemonade. The silent girl, er man, I corrected, hopped up and got busy at the replicator station. Liang will bring our drinks shortly. Let's go enjoy our drinks from the main deck, Sahun said, and led the way out of the kitchen.